въпроси. Имаме страшно много въпроси, между другото. Не съм сигурен дали ще успеем да зададем всички, за което се извинявам предварително. Но, както казах и в началото, в случай, че имате въпроси към нашите лектори, непосредствено след края на евента ще имаме едно така своеобразно малко парти с Джони Локър, ще може да пием по едно питие и да си поговорим малко допълнително с тях. А пропо, от... Оставали са ми около три бутилки Джонни Уокър в а, бакстейджа и решихме, <laughs> решихме че а, тримата души, които са задали тримата, трите най-интересни въпроса според нашите лектори, ще получат по една бутилка Джонни Уокър, така че и това предстои. Carry on, yes. А, добре, предлагам да започваме. Okay, I'm not going to introduce any, any of you, lady and gentlemen. I mean, somebody has got to say it. This has been a huge sausage fest, hasn't it? <laughs> the optics is bad. <laughs> the optics is bad, yes. We, we did our best. Uh, okay, so as I, as I said previously, there's plenty of questions to be answered here, but I want to start off uh, first with, with Peter, because I think it's important to address that. Peter, what brings you joy in life? <laughs> <laughs> questions like that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I... I I do not understand why people think I'm such a downer. Like, <laughs> like I have no idea why. What a, there's a, there's a, a, a quote out there from a critic who says, whenever I feel my will to live becoming too strong, I read Peter Watts. <laughs> And I think you guys will all agree I'm a pretty cuddly, cheersome, cheerful guy in, in person, right? Like, I am as delusionally optimistic as the rest of you. I don't expect, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of happy with my life right now. I don't expect that to last. I do not expect to die in a jurisdiction with a stable infrastructure. I do not expect to die peacefully. Where do you live? Um, <laughs> north of the United States. And he lives in Canada, But for Christ's sake. Yeah, I live in Canada. And, and I mean, yeah, we're fucked. But... What, What can Canada I do with it? I got myself sterilized in, in 1991. I've never, I'd never owned a car. I don't generally eat meat, except when I come to Bulgaria, which apparently is a country founded on meat. <laughs> you like try and plant turnips and you have to dig through the layer of meat <laughs> before you can get Peter, to actual soil. Canada is supposedly <laughs> going to be uh, the world's barn through climate change. Canada is going to be okay. Canada is going to be okay until the U.S. finishes hoovering up their half of the Great Lakes and our half of the Great Lakes. And then they will decide that they have to spread democracy north of the border. <laughs> um, because, yeah, their they're, they're, they're run of bad oil. weather, which they will probably still attribute to a Chinese hoax, will, will have rendered most of the southern states uninhabitable. And the fact that we have socialized medicine means obviously we're on the side of the commies. And they will decide to just move in. And I don't know if there's a whole lot we can do about it. I do hope that with our minuscule, cute military budget, we at least work on some kind of a, a bio-war agent that targets Republicans. I'm well, gonna... maybe, maybe start with <laughs> building a wall. <laughs> I think we're going to have to just stop you. <laughs> just stop you there. It's getting it's in, getting dark places now. Um, all right. So we've been talking a lot a lot about the future and what are the traits or, or types of behaviors that we have to change in order to solve ourselves. And uh, we have a question here from the audience, uh, which is related to one of the claims I think that Peter made. You know that we have to remove things like greed, for example. And Gilly, you said something interesting. You know that we. Uh, Sometimes we change things that we are not sure how they are related to others. So the question here is the following. Let's say that we remove greed for some reason, whether it's you know, like moral evolution or, or we change you know, something biologically. Wouldn't that remove most of our human motivation to you know, both develop ourselves and procreate and inevitably lead to our demise? I mean, Jonathan, what do you think? about whether we should do that or... Whether, whether changing a certain trait that currently defines humanity Would could mean in the no future. no longer human? Yeah. Yeah, it might, but then there's no reason to, think, to suspect that we wouldn't necessarily want to stay the same anyway. I mean, most species don't stay the same. They either go extinct or they, they diversify and evolve into something else. So... Right. It, I don't... S I mean, I th there is an element, I suppose, that... Um, 
the, 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 our human qualities, if we're no longer human, what does that, what does that mean? But I mean, I, I mean, I think I, I don't hold much hope in terms of modifying something vague like greed in terms of, certainly from a genetic perspective. Right. I mean, you, could, you can do genome-wide association studies, I bet you could, for greed, um, probably. Um, but you would then end up with thousands, if hundreds, of, if not thousands of hits, and right. then you're left with what? I don't know. Right, I'm not going to ask Peter this question uh, because he's obviously not a human aficionado. Now, now uh, Robin, you do like volcanoes, but I'm going to pass the questions to you, uh, okay. to, to you as well. So which are the human traits that you would remove? The human if traits you, I would remove? Yes, or types of human behaviors. Ooh. Patience? <laughs> Patience? <laughs> yeah, because then things oh, will happen fine. faster. It might be bad, yep. but it'll be hilarious. <laughs> 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 But, but this is exactly why I'm never going to be put in charge of anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Uh, Yuri, you wanted to contribute, I think. No, I was just going to say that um, uh, if greed is a concept of, uh, of capitalism, uh, so, is so is diversification. So. so you would remove capitalism and diversification? I would remove capitalism, religion... Uh, well, let's start with those two and then move on. Let's we'll, we'll see what happens. <laughs> let's see All if right. we can imagine a future where... There's no capitalism. I think this ratio, like, unintentionally became the most liberal show that we ever had <laughs> uh, recently. Uh, so what do you guys think? What would you change in humanity? Hmm. Okay. Um, the perception of a dominant alpha male. Whoa. Now, I'm, I'm borrowing <laughs> this from Donna Haraway, who's amazing. And, um, and if you haven't read her, then I, I strongly recommend. And she has a very interesting reading in relating to, um, um, in, in a book called Simon, uh, Simeon Cyborgs, and I, I'm now not doing justice to the book's title. That's wonderful. Continue drinking, Gilly. Um, but what she proposed is that the way we used to look at biological systems is somewhat misguided and was done in quite the same way. And a lot of what happened later, as these studies in, um, uh, in primates were done in uh, early uh, 20th century, later um, affected uh, psychology studies and theories, and then theories in economy, and then theories in sex studies, etc., etc. And everything had to do with this specific type of win that is one person's win over everything and not a collaborative system. Mm -hmm. If I could take that out and propose maybe more collaboration and thinking about goals and gaining them in a more um, systematic way, that there's an overall win and we can share a win, I would go for that. Martin, can we do that? <coughs> <laughs> so th th there is a general issue that I have with these uh, proposals of taking out one trait that is considered problematic, right? Because in many cases you would have to do this globally at the same time because otherwise you run into massive problems. For example, if you take out humans' ability of, for massive destruction, for evil so to speak, uh, and say, you, right, you, you miss one small island, basically they could at any given moment just dominate everyone, <laughs> right? So if you don't take it from all people at the same time, you run into problems. And I think it's even the same with uh, traits such as greed. Uh, we could say as long as we live in something like a free market, which actually turned out uh, to be the only system that really works and makes the life of people better, then those who still keep their greed, they will financially dominate everyone else. So again, right. we run into this problem, either everyone does it at the same time or we shouldn't do it. And the probability that there is not a single person that keeps this trade is very small. You see this also in nature, the stable the stable system is not the one where everyone is weak and incapable 
of mayhem, but where everyone is armed. Because at, at least, and then I'm not talking about guns and stuff, but, but, but generally speaking, it's, it's like with trees. Uh, they all grow, you know, the large trees, there's a maximum, and they try to reach this, because if they would all just decide to go small, the moment one goes large, it's not stable anymore. It has too much uh, benefit. So, so I think when we talk about this optimization, removing greed, removing uh, brutality genetically or biologically, we either would have to find a way to do it all at the same time and then to really make sure that it can't be reversed in any case because then the stability would be lost. I think I, that's I why think Peter wants to use the Zika virus, right? I mean, you want to essentially... Militarize it. I, I, I think that your, your analysis is predicated on an assumption that I, that I would reject, and that is basically you're saying if you take greed away, we're all going to be a bunch of pussies. Yes. And that, and that the, you know, then can, the, can, the can mean standard people. Can we stop here with that, like, <laughs> misguided terminology? Can I we put a stop to that one? <laughs> Alpha like, male vocabulary. First of all, as opposed to your ridiculous genitalia, pussies are much hunger, <laughs> uh, like, much yeah, more agile, and can bring babies <laughs> to the world. <laughs> That's okay, and though. whatever stack of balls you have, one kick and it's done. Yeah, this is, this is true. I think, I think most people here understand that I'm also speaking of pussies as pussies. metaphorically as it is used as okay. yes, an offensive Find term. Find a better metaphor. It's 29. But my point, is, <laughs> my point is, the basic presumption is wrong, I think. I think that I've, when you eliminate greed, greed, you do not necessarily eliminate hatred. You do not necessarily eliminate the capacity for violence or retribution. Um, I wrote a story once in which weaponized yogurt was used to reprogram the, you know, the gut biota, which reprogrammed the pattern matching circuits in the amygdala via the vagus nerve, so that anybody who saw the Google logo, logo would be driven into a, an uncontrollable violent rage. So if you walk down the street with a Google t-shirt, you get kicked to death by an angry mob. <laughs> um, I don't think, I mean, you're, you seem to be associating greed with softness or a lack of resolve. No, no, no. Uh, I, I'm actually not linking those. I'm not linking those traits. Uh, they can be absolutely independent. I don't know if they are, but they could. But if we only talk about the capacity for violence without the greed aspect, still uh, a situation where nobody is capable of violen violence, mm -hmm. but then one population shows up that is capable of violence, uh, of violence there wouldn't be anything we could do about it. This is not the stable system because a small <coughs> tweak could overthrow everything. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Yeah. Yuri, do you want to point something out? So, uh, a few things. One is that um, whenever we are... So, when we, when we discuss... Um, very poetic human traits in scientific terms. I think we do injustice both to the poetry and to the science. So eliminating greed, that's one thing. Um, I, I, and, I'm, and I'm not, nor this, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a poet, but I happen, to, as, as far as I know, we've not secured the genetic formula for greed. But putting that aside. Dopamine. Uh, <laughs> Um, uh, um, a major part of the liberal project in the past two centuries is, uh, is incrementalism. And we've done through social change and behavioral change, social change that affected behavioral change and political change, we've accomplished a lot. We've invented a concept called childhood and we've decided we're not going to for instance, employ or make ch children work. So we are capable of doing these incremental big changes um, in society. And they, the, the problem with this is that they take tens or more than that years. But they do happen. Uh, we've changed. Uh, if you look at the last 150 years, there's, uh, Gilly would not be here 100 years ago. Uh, on stage, I mean. Right. Um, I'm not sure if I would be. And, but, you know, and so forth. Yeah. Um, 
So we are capable of change. And but like everything good, it takes time it takes and time. it takes effort. But if we speak uh, uh, about like a total change, you know, something that we can implement, you know, across across society, something that we are seeing happening right now, and something that that is almost certain to happen in the future, that it's all all of us will be interconnected. And we have a few questions here related to this uh, to this topic. I mean, what do you think about <coughs> this this future that is coming in which? Uh, everything is connected to uh, to the internet. You know, all our devices, you know, fridges, you know, ovens, TVs, and potentially our brains. So what do you think about that? Um, not between one and start. three in the morning. Not between <laughs> one and three. Yeah, not my brain anyway. <laughs> private time. <laughs> I don't. I don't want to know what you're doing. No, no one these does. Hours. Volcanoes <laughs> are connected to the internet. Some degree. How are they connected to the internet? You, you can email them. No, that's not true. But you can, <laughs> if they erupt or, or, or look like they're going to erupt, they, I kind of get a text, which is cute. <laughs> which is like, I'm really angry, basically, is one volcano. And you're like, oh, that's cool. I might be able to write about it soon. Please, <laughs> right. please, then you sort of, please don't kill anyone. And they normally don't, so it's good. But right. occasionally, oh, honestly. Rude. So, so can, you, can, you, can you guys speculate like on uh, you know what the human species will look like? You know, in terms of human evolution and, and, and stuff like that. There, there was this super. You talked about this actually, not uh, well, uh, yesterday. Um, so, you know, the idea is if, if you really manage to connect every brain somehow to the internet, and it's somehow the same internet, can you even then uh, really draw an outer line to what constitutes the individual anymore? This was actually what I wittered on about at length in 2017 when I gave a talk in this very auditorium. Ah, there go. Yeah, I wasn't that, there. That, that, yeah, Elon Musk's whole um, explicit mandate, or his explicit uh, manifesto, rather, is he wants to connect um, brains to other brains and to the internet as seamlessly as our neocortex is connected to our limbic system. And nobody seems to have asked, okay, is your limbic system conscious? Does it have, I mean, do we use it for anything other than to take out the garbage? The, the, everything we know about consciousness is that it expands to fill the space available. And as long as latency and bandwidth don't fall below certain limits, um, the kind of technology that Musk is proposing in Neuralink um, would literally, I think, result in a vast, not a hive mind because it wouldn't be a hive, it would be a single coherent sense of self. And the individual components, once connected to it, wouldn't be able to pull out again any more than your temporal lobe could vote yeah. to secede from the rest of your brain. And, and I would absolutely agree because there is even evidence for this to happen in literature that we already have, scientific literature, as you, you, you the experiment, split yeah. brain experiment. You cut a person's brain into two, right? They're connected. What, uh, you don't do this for fun, of course. This is if, uh, well, you <laughs> can, but you should. This is the 50s for, um, <laughs> um, um, to cure um, never to piss to you cure off. epilepsy. <laughs> epilepsy yeah. Right, right. In the past. To cure greed, yes. Greed. <laughs> well, you cure, yes. Get a lot of problems. <laughs> so you cut this brain in half. There is this corpus callosum that uh, connects your two brain hemispheres. And what's actually happening is those two brain regions, left brain, right brain, they can't communicate anymore, and they seem to develop their own, their will of their own, their own consciousness. So develop, they develop different plans for their future. There is re research that, you know, depicts cases where the left brain became more liberal, the other, the other part uh, more conservative. Atheist versus religious. Yeah, atheist and religious. So you can really but take what one. What did he choose in the election, though? <laughs> Or well, three. if you could, it depends because you know it's the left brain usually that can talk, so it will mm -hmm. say, "Oh, I'm liberal," uh, and the left brain mostly controls the right part of the body. But, but the if lever he, is operated by the left. Yeah, <laughs> in that case, <laughs> read up these experiments. It's crazy, but it basically shows that if you have one brain, which we could say we experience ourselves as one consciousness, you can split it into two separate consciousness. This says. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I would be very surprised that if you manage to directly connect individual brains, they wouldn't start to experience themselves as one single consciousness. And I, I don't know if this is outside 
of what could theoretically be possible with linking brains via some form of internet. It's not just theoretically possible, it's actually trivial. The, the bandwidth, this is one of the cool things about, about having people, about randomly hitting a, the bullseye and, and having people think you know something about neurology is all of a sudden actual neuroscientists are willing to talk to you. And I got one of them to run some back of the envelope calculations for me a few years back. And it turns out that once you account for synaptic redundancy and signal noise, the bandwidth of the corpus callosum is comparable to that of a standard conventional smartphone. We're not even talking 5G yet. Just your standard today smartphone. So that kind of bandwidth is all it takes to moosh consciousnesses together. I mean, you guys are all dual core hive minds, but you don't think of yourselves as dual core, even though we know that, that you can support on that same wetware at least two completely different sapient individuals. Also, they don't, they're not completely isolated. They can, the halves can still talk via the brainstem, but it's this long, squeezy route as opposed to a fat pipe. And that's where they figured out the whole the signal lag. You need to have something like less than 400 milliseconds latency between, uh, amongst the entire system for it to cohere into a single. But again, 400 milliseconds latency, that's less than what you get in large chunks of the internet even today. Um, and it, it, I have to say, I'm kind of surprised. I wonder if there's like a part of me that's just so stupid and uneducated that I haven't realized why this isn't a concern. Because it does concern me. Mm -hmm. And I don't see too many other people addressing it. But it seems like a pretty obvious thing to worry about, given what we know about the way the brain works. I think if you, it's if super you, if cool. If you allow me, gentlemen, I would just like to carry on because we have quite a lot of questions uh, coming in. And I would like to get into some, some more specific ones, right? Um, so we have questions to, to our geneticists in the, uh, in the panel. Now, you have two. That's good. I have two, yes. One from uh, your so mother, one from your father. No. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking about um, you know, the specific things that we can do nowadays, we have a question about um, if we change um, in an embryo um, you know, certain, certain genes, can we eliminate things like you know, predisposition to cancer or you know, autoimmune disease? Is that something that we're capable of doing at this point? Do you want to start? So, uh, <coughs> I mean, we can definitely eradicate certain predispositions to cancer. I was actually working during my PhD thesis on a specific predisposition of cancer, and if there's a defect that we know, of course we can correct for this, especially with the new tools that we have. So you were CRISPR it. You were exactly, like I was CRISPRing. I was basically CRISPRing predispositions to cancer mm -hmm. of a certain disease, and, and that's absolutely possible. This would absolutely be possible. So how many of those do we know? Sorry? How many of those can we identify, you know, like predispositions to cancer? Oh, it's, it's hard to say. Basically, so every one of you, I'm sorry to tell you this, but <laughs> Within this talk that you're listening to, your body will accumulate more DNA. It's okay. Have a drink. It's okay. <laughs> it, it takes a positive turn in the end. Okay. Your body will accumulate <laughs> more DNA lesions than all of the letters of all languages in Wikipedia are combined. It's a lot of DNA damage, but we have a lot of repair enzymes that correct for the very most of those lesions. It's only a few slip through. Now, those repair networks, they are super complex and complicated. And roughly speaking, every component of this repair complex, when it's damaged, leads you to a certain predisposition for cancer. You know this, for example, this, uh, this actor lady, what was she called? Uh, Yes, thank you very much, random person. <laughs> Actually. <laughs> and it's too many degrees on this stage to look around. So she had a certain predisposition for cancer. It was highly unlikely that she gets breast cancer or ovarian cancer. So she just cut it out, or at least the, the breast cancer part, right? Mm -hmm. So if you know it. But of course, if we knew it in the embryo, we could correct for this mutation, right? That's also something, you know, when people say, should we... Uh, yeah, this, this is Hee-Yang Kui. Do you see this up there? This is the guy who made the designer babies. Mm -hmm. Um, it's very hard to argue if there are two people where you know they have the predisposition for cancer and they want to make a biological child and they really want to do this. Then <clears throat> sometimes, it's, you know, it's not always bad to have children, but that's another <laughs> discussion. Um, so you could say we should never change the human genome and this person should only, I don't know, when they're 25, just remove their breasts. Uh, 
why would this be ethically better than to say, let's just correct for the stupid mutation? And they can keep their breasts and they won't get this cancer as likely. So uh, I think once you've identified a specific disease, it's really not obvious to say the ethical decision is always to not interfere with the genome. Right. The issue also is that you, if you're talking about damaged genes rather than improving humans, we already have, we're already doing it. We're already removing damaged genes from the gene pool. If you have significant Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry, if you are... What now? Sorry? <laughs> Go on. Yeah, <laughs> if, if you're uh, Greek Cypriot. So these are, these are techniques of pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. So if it's likely that you, based on your ancestry, that you will be carrying damaged genes that, that will predispose you to cancers or certain uh, diseases like Huntington's disease like that, then you, you can have... Yeah, tay -Sachs. Then mm -hmm. you can have... Uh, uh, you'll have uh, pre-implantation <coughs> genetic diagnosis performed on embryos that were in vitro fertilized. You then remove the embryos that have the damaged genes and you keep the, the embryos that have the perfectly normal genes. You've done no engineering, but you have selected against individuals that carry those genes. This is eugenics, it, by mm. the very Thank definition you. of eugenics, but it's... It's positive. It's 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 done. It's done with the blessings of the churches involved. So right. For instance. I got a comment on that because, uh, um, uh, uh, to the best of my knowledge, Israel is one of the leaders uh, in prenatal or pr examinations of embryos and so forth. Mm -hmm. Is that prenatal exams? Is that is that how it's called? Okay. Pre so uh, one of, uh, Israel is one of the leaders, if not the leader, in the world in. Uh, parents wanting perfect, pitch perfect babies, and um, there is a cost to that. And um, every time there's another test involved, there's a genuine cost involved yes. with 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 checking for that. And then it really depends on your healthcare system if that if it's yes. part of that or is it extra or the, and so. But the forth. cost is a fraction of what CRISPR would be. And it has no risks. Okay. So can you comment on the fact that, at least that's the claim of the person who's asking the question, that CRISPR is considered a weapon of mass destruction among the intelligence community? Can it be used for that? What? A weapon of CRISPR. mass destruction? A weapon of mass destruction, yes. For the what? For the it's intelligence community? For the intelligence community. Ah, intelligence the spies, yes. of military uh -huh. stuff. Uh -huh. Well, you don't even need CRISPR. There was, <clears throat> oh man, I forgot the details, but it, it went something like this. There was a group that published a paper. They recreated a virus that was extinct. It's called the horsepox virus. And they did this, I think, uh, you know, they ordered, the, 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 sequ uh, the, the, the genome is known, right? And it's easy to sequence, so the genome, sorry, of the virus. And it's easy to sequence short fragments of DNA. So they ordered the complete genome on the internet in fragments, I think from a German company, and put it together and recreated the complete horsepox virus, right? Roughly speaking, they just put those uh, virus segments into a cell and the cell by itself produced the virus. This is what viruses do. Okay, so we can do this for the horsepox virus. We can do it exactly the same way for the human smallpox virus. Mm -hmm which until recently actually killed millions of people every year. We could do this, and I think they said it cost them, I think it was around $100,000. That's nothing. And we even know how to make viruses more dangerous. We could uh, add a, a signal molecule, that's, or, or the gene for a signal molecule, some interleukin, that actually inhibits your immune response and makes viruses even more deadly because your immune system doesn't react to it properly. And, you know, people claim, I mean, I, I was looking over these papers roughly, if you have a master's degree in biology, you could do this. Why wouldn't terror, I mean, I think even Saddam Hussein had a PhD, am I mistaken? People, people can do this, this is not so hard. And How many master's degrees in biology? Not in biology, biology, I think in architecture or something. Any Nothing hey. against architects. So, no, it was not <laughs> biology, that's what I'm saying. I think most dictators are medical doctors. I it's think it's a, it's a statistical fact, yes, <laughs> in like Africa. Yeah. Uh, we, we have a question for Robin. It comes from a gastroenterologist. 
and I'm not sure whether I should ask them <laughs> ask that, but uh, with what type of farts are volcanoes comparable? Shall we skip that? What type of farts? <laughs> are, com are volcanoes comparable? <laughs> there are, are there Elaborate types of on that. I mean, like, oh, man, it's pretty grim. I, think, I like think the question should be asked to the person himself. You know? Maybe, but, like, so... <laughs> Uh, let's put, so let's so put so it a this volcano, way. A volcano is basically defined when something, <laughs> something. Oh, the visual is you so mean grim. Something is underground. Fart. Something. Un no, a fart no, no, is well, not so a fart. Something underground, <laughs> like molten, does come out of the surface, and farts ideally do not involve this, because then you're pooing. <laughs> what <are> you, <laughs> technically speaking. <laughs> so. So if <laughs> what do you feel so laid if you down fart, on your... if you fart, there are volcanic explosions that cause gas to come out <laughs> without any magma, and they're called <laughs> hydrothermal blasts. So that would be what a fart is ideally like. But obviously, every now and then, something slips through, and then in both cases, people can die. <laughs> <laughs> so that is that is the answer to that question. I think yeah. the, the question was about <laughs> chemical composition. I think. Nah, no, it's a physical thing. Is, is, is magma now lava, basically? That's it. So, you know, if, if your magma regularly becomes lava when you don't mean it to, I would see a doctor. Diapers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, can I, because uh, it's known about farts, but let's ask about volcanoes as well. Uh, is a single volcano that is currently on Earth capable of killing us all? Uh, no, which is no. great, because everyone normally thinks Yellowstone is going to kill us all, but that's only because the Daily Express says it, it three times a day, um, but there's actually no <laughs> evidence that it will. Like, it's called a super volcano, and that just means a volcano that at some point has ex <laughs> expelled a, um, uh, like a thousand uh, cubic kilometers of like, volcanic material, which is a lot, and that can cause horrible like, climate effects, it can cause like, agriculture devastation. However... <coughs> Just because a volcano has done this once, it doesn't mean it will ever do it again. It's like an Olympic athlete. Just because it's got gold once or twice doesn't mean they will ever do it again. It might have retired. And these volcanoes often just freeze away and die. And even if you did get that kind of eruption, humanity has already lived through one of these like tens of thousands of years ago. And we had no, none of the technology we have now, and we still are around. So it would be uh, horrible. It would be like the worst... like. You know, disaster ever, but we wouldn't. It wouldn't end the world or anything like that. You know, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> Does that include underwater volcanoes? Huh? Underwater the volcanoes. They're less. They're even less dangerous because the the sea muffles them. It's like farting into a pillow. If I'm going to use that kind of, you know, use <laughs> that kind of very technical analogy, it's it's like a silencer. It's just great. So Boom. underwater volcanoes even less threatening, and most volcanoes are underwater. It's, it's uh, roughly 70% on Earth, but that's, really, that's a really big guess. But most volcanoes happen underwater, which is really inconvenient for scientists, but really convenient for everyone else, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> so just a quick question. Can you, can you actually make a volcano erupt, like throwing an atom bomb in it or, nope. or something like you, that? Weirdly, you can't, like, because scientists have actually tried to do this. <laughs> Uh, which is great. Of course which they is great. Do. So, like, they've done, they've tried the conventional bomb things weirdly to try and stop a volcano erupting, but which intuitively is like, that, that seems bad. Like, it's erupting. Why don't we bomb it to see if it will stop? It turns out that it just, the lava just kind of goes around the, the crater. It just doesn't give a shit about the fact that we tried to bomb it. So, it just doesn't work. Like, American, the American Air Force has tried to do that in Hawaii. Doesn't work. Um, they've kind of inadvertently tried to nuke volcanoes. So, there's, um, in Alaska, it's just full of volcanoes, basically, that whole kind of part of the world is. <laughs> and uh, at some point during the Cold War, the Americans uh, uh, got very, very powerful atomic bombs and buried them near very active volcanic systems. Kind of coincidentally, because it was remote, but anyway. And they set these bombs off, and uh, literally the volcanoes did nothing. They did absolutely nothing. They didn't react to like the most powerful explosive devices right next door. So... So even, even a hydrogen bomb will not make no, it? No, it's not, no one's saying it's impossible, because like, maybe like one day, it would, but it, it seems very uh, improbable. And if it was like you know, Yellowstone super volcano, the magma chamber, which is barely molten anyway, is so far down beneath the surface. That, like, it's not like just like if you crack open the floor, you're like, oh, shit, lava. No, it's not like that. It's like several miles down. You, even the most powerful nuclear device ever created, if you detonated it at the surface... You, the volcano would do nothing. It wouldn't even chip a crater barely deep enough to do anything. It would inconveniently 
ra irradiate everyone in the area, maybe create some superheroes <laughs> or something. But basically, the worst you're going to do is make ra lava radioactive, which, funnily enough, is probably a bad idea. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but like, no, like volcanoes, vo like, like the same with hurricanes. Uh, you know, some someone recently suggested nuking hurricanes. Can't think of who that was. Um, and scientists have actually thought this through, and like, the hurricanes are just... It was Donald it, Trump. Yes, it was. <laughs> Point to the man at the end. But, um, <laughs> but hurricanes and earthquakes and volcanoes are, like, m are just magnitudes more powerful and energetic than the most powerful nuclear device we've ever created. So the, nature just, just brushes it off, basically. You know? so, so the saying that we can blow up the Earth with... It's not really possible. Yeah, we, we would kill we'll everyone. We, we, no, we would just get rid of... Like things Life living at the surface, but the volcano would just just be like meh, you know. So right. you are you going know. against the the, the central <laughs> myth of Scientology. You know that. The, right. Oh well. Oh god. I Never mind. That, yeah. <laughs> now, 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 uh, Gilly, you are an architect, right? And when we're speaking about underground, and when, when we are talking about all these gloom scenarios that apparently await all of us, um, have you? Put a thought in how will these populations, if they survive, and doesn't matter how big they will be, will live? I mean, will that be underground? And if that's the case, how do you imagine that as an architect looking like? So, the program I, um, I went to for a master's degree had uh, a lot to do with trying to foresee environmental doomsday scenarios, if that makes sense, and how to correlate with it how to simulate it, how it would potentially affect its environment at the moment, and what would you do as an architect to kind of respond to it. So some um, brilliant uh, classmates of mine uh, made a whole project relating to um, land aggregation and floods in India, for example, trying to simulate that. Where would water go? Where would you fortify the land? And where would you place housing? And in what typology? So it would uh, correlate with it. So. That's just one example. Uh, my, the thesis uh, project I was working uh, with my colleagues had to do with building in um, extreme climate surroundings. Uh, we chose the Sahara, for example, and trying to think about what would happen in an extreme climate uh, surroundings along with um, well, climate change and how could you use locally resourced material and build on site. Uh, we kind of solved it around, we kind of, we solved it around robotic fabrication, robots that are um, sent on site using whatever um, uh, material is found on site and relying on vernacular architecture. So architecture that is um, produced over years of experiment, right. um, transformed from one generation to another, kind of rereading that in, into robotic fabrication. To answer that, um, I would say there are two main approaches. One has to do with architecture that remains, and one has to do with architecture that does not. So you could go about fortifying the hell out of a structure, but you could also think, okay, these changes are happening. They're happening every so and so years. Maybe it would make more sense to build something that is lightweight, that is easily destructed, but easily rebuilt, so it doesn't affect the environment in such a, um, in such a negative way. It doesn't omit more carbon footprint. It doesn't create more um, uh, trash, basically. Right. It's uh, more sustainable, right? Exactly. So sustainability has so many ways to go about it nowadays in simulating what are your environmental parameters and how you adapt to it. Which materials would you use? Um, what would be the kind of process used in building it? How much carbon footprint would the process have? Not only ma the material. Um, what else? Energy consumption of the future building, for example, yep. is a major topic nowadays. And to add to that, there's always a human factor. If we're not talking about the doomsday scenario and we're talking about everyday structures that are built for human society, we need to cater for the best of human society. Right. Um, yeah, not, not depressing, repetitive structures that we know from our surroundings, but spaces that would cater to, to our minds, to our souls, to, to their functions. Etc. Um, I would say, I would recommend that you look at the works of Toyo Ito, super interesting Japanese architect, uh, that has to do with um, 
extreme um, environmental scenarios and building relief houses that are built from recycled materials and are very lightweight. It's beautiful. Right. Right, now, Peter, you do write science fiction. How do you imagine that we will live in the future in terms of habitats? Um, well, as was mentioned before, I, I do definitely think that we will persist as a species. Um, I think a lot can be determined by what the ultra-rich refer to as the event. Um, there was a recent headline. I, was, I, was, I had to give a talk in a series called Seeding Utopia, Resisting Dystopia. And the whole point of this series of, of events was to try and act as a counterweight against the gloom and doom and, and to provide some optimism as a counterweight to that. So I gave a talk that was going to be a counterweight to the rest of the series. <laughs> but I had to start off with something that was optimistic. And so the first optimistic thing I could find was a headline um, showing that Elon Musk and, and um, Warren Buffett and a, a few others, basically all the world's billionaires are agreed that this is the best time to be alive. But the world's billionaires are also, wait, there we go. Um, but the world's billionaires are also investing in armed compounds in New Zealand. The world's billionaires are also buying up decommissioned missile silos um, in the Colorado mountains. Uh, the better to wait out this thing they refer to as the event, um, which is their term for what they see as an inevitable and imminent social collapse in which everybody is going to hate them. And they are literally hiring futurists and consultants to advise them on how to retain control of their private military forces once the ceiling crashes in and their money's no good anymore and their armed forces realize we have all the guns and these guys can't even wipe their asses without help, we're going to take over the silos. And what's your retainer on that? <clears throat> One of the things that they were talking about was explosive callers Jesus around Christ, Peter. the necks of their guards. This, I am not making this up. This is a report that was published. In fact, there may even be a, a slide showing an excerpt from it that was published by one of the consultants who was brought in reporting back on what the ultra-rich are planning. They see, yeah, there we go. They see, they see what's coming. They're not idiots. They know what's coming. They are making plans. We are not part of those plans. My solution would be not to use explosive callers, but to get rid of human <laughs> um, paramilitary <laughs> entirely and use drones. Um, and I actually wrote a story in which there's so much anger that in fact that a lot of these people who had been laid off, who used to be, you know, they used to have military experience, they used to work for the ultra rich, they've been laid off and replaced by drones, but they now know how to figure up a, a U-Haul truck full of capacitors to create an EMP that takes out all the drones and then just lets the hordes, once your drones are gone, just lets your average guy in the street realize that there are some undefended rich people here and just let nature take its course. That was also one, that's one of the most upbeat stories I've ever written. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's, uh, um, it, was, it, was, it was fun to write, but the, the point is I'm not making this shit up. There will be survivors. I don't know, I, su I rather suspect that the, the mentality of people that entitled would probably result in them having their own little mini apocalypse once they're in the silo. I suspect they might end up killing each other. But <laughs> if technology is going to survive, these people are already, I mean, Elon Musk wants to go to Mars. Like, think about the, think about the logistics of that. What kind of earth-shattering cataclysm would render Earth so uninhabitable that Mars would be a better alternative? I don't know if he's thought it through, or I don't know if Mars isn't some cover story for building a giant space ark to go to Alpha Centauri or something. I have no idea what's going on. But the point is, the people with the resources are, are taking measures. And I suspect some of them, because there are so many of them, some of them are going to work. And that's probably where civilization is going to be a, a, a hundred years from now. You may have these, these <laughs> yes, <laughs> you may have these enclaves of, of, of high tech and on the surface, you will have a lot of people living, I think, as feudal nomads. 
there will be large chunks of, of the world where you literally will not be able to move without going hyperthermic. Um, there'll be something like 90 days a year by 2100 in which in parts, large parts of the southern US, you will literally not be able to exercise before without dying from heat stroke. Um, so there will be a lot of migration. I think there'll be a lot of, you know, I, th I think that, that civilization technically will collapse, but that there will probably be these little domes or enclaves that may last longer and may actually form kind of a repository of technology for us to rediscover at some future period in time. All right, uh, Jonathan. <laughs> you want me to follow that? Yes, <laughs> please. Brian, so it's, once again, With it's, what? So it's Eloise and Morax <coughs> then? Yeah, pr okay. right. How simply you say it. <laughs> yeah, right, of course. So, John, what do we know about the inheritability of certain things like intelligence or, you know, the, the, the feeling of well-being and happiness, let's say? Well, I mean, Martin explained heritability really well because it's one of the most misunderstood terms in genetics. Um, <coughs> it, it, it is, it's simply what proportion of the, of the variation in anything you look at can be explained by variation in, in the genetic variability of a population. Um, I, one, one of my favorite examples of that is height. So the Dutch are officially the tallest nation on the planet. Okay. Um, in 1850, they were amongst the smallest people in Europe. Now, the genetics hasn't changed. Okay. Hmm. What has changed is healthcare and, and diet and so forth. But that explains, so heritability is, I should have defined this, heritability of height is, is 80%. So right. most of the variation in height that we see is down to genetic variation. But you can see, if you don't get the environment right, the genetics is irrelevant. Right. And the same is true for IQ. You are <coughs> seeing people, my own country for instance, uh, Dominic Cummings, who is, Ooh, yeah, oh, quite. Yeah. You're who, who, he originally worked for Michael Gove. When he worked oh. for Michael Gove, he wrote a report saying, we need to start, to start doing genetic testing of uh, high school children so that we can work out uh, how to make, um, you know, how to do well. Britain for great these. again? Sorry? How to make Britain great again? How to make Britain great again, yeah. <laughs> it's an early form of that, yeah. Now, the point about heritability of IQ is obviously there's an environmental component. If everybody was genetically identical, <coughs> all the variation in IQ would be environmental. The flip side to that is if your environment is fairly equal, genetics will become more important. The UK's environment is most definitely not equal. Right. So genetics is irrelevant at this point in terms of IQ. Let's start addressing economic inequality first. And then we can do genetics, probably. So where do you guys stand on the nature and nurture debate? We have a question here related to that. Well, I've talked, so I don't want Martin. Martin? Well, what these twin studies show is that, um, I mean, we, we always think, you know, we, we, our brains, they like to think binary. We think this is a trait, okay, this is a genetic trait, this is a trait formed by the environment. But as these twin studies show, for almost all of our traits, there is a certain aspect of environment and a certain aspect of genetics. And the difference, where on this spectrum a trait is positioned, this varies massively. For example, uh, whether or not you love, I don't know, model planes or whatever. Then certainly there's probably a genetic component to it, but it will be a very small one compared to the genetic component of your eye color. There is not much you can do to change your eye color, except for maybe like Donald Trump stare at the sun without glasses for extended <laughs> periods of time. Maybe they, they bleach out a little bit, but you know. Um, so nature nurture versus nurture, you always have to apply to a specific trait. And the truth is that the vast majority of traits that actually seem interesting to us, like for example, empathy, intelligence, you can, Okay, you have a genetic component to those, but I think the best way to view those genetic components is as a kind of rough upper limit where you could get with ideal conditions. Height is a brilliant example, right? I don't have the genetics to be 2 meters 10. <laughs> Some people have. I ended up a certain height, but if I would have been 
malnourished in my childhood, I would be super small. So genetics, in most cases, for most traits that are interesting, they don't really determine what you're going to be. They set a certain limit. I probably don't have the mental capacity for an IQ of 140 uh, or to become the world leading professor for theoretical physics. But I could have ended up a way bigger idiot than I actually am <laughs> if I, you know, made some stupid decisions in the past. Yeah, and the only thing, I mean, that's, that's exactly right. The only thing I would add to that, and it's what we were talking about, nature nurture, is environment and genetic variation is one thing. There's also a hidden aspect, which is stochastic variation. So biological systems are noisy. So even if you could homogenize everything, they would, you would still get variation because the developmental program is a noisy program. Going from an egg to an adult is a noisy process. There will be mistakes. You're all running on... <laughs> <laughs> The very definition of noise. <laughs> yeah. Egg to oh, adult. Or a problem. Yeah. The, the, we, we're all running on the same genetic program, essentially, as when we're starting from embryos. But we're not, we're not symmetrical. Maybe, maybe that's something we should actually mention. I think we never put down those numbers. But when we talk about this genetic variability, uh, if you just look at the base pair positions, all of us are equal to roughly 99.9% yeah, of our complete genome. So when we talk about genetic differences, is this 0.1% that to most degree are just single letters in the DNA, yeah. as Jonathan has uh, visualized. Can, can I add something yes, to that? Yes, go ahead, Just because uh, it was another thing I, I was exposed to recently, and I, I, I think it's just interesting. So there was a study also in the UK, done in uh, 2011, that had to do with uh, societal inequalities. Oh, yeah. Mm. Um, Pickett and Andrews. Um, that had to do with um, life longevity. Um, how often do you find in a, in a population tendency to suicidal thoughts, um, mental illnesses, um, and also caters to other subjects as how much do you trust people around you in a society? And it has everything to do with societal gaps. How much the difference is in, in, in a salary, mm. for example. And this study was done in, in uh, uh, what's the term, sorry, first, uh, first, first world countries? Right. Affluent societies. It's insane. It is unbelievable, the correlation between the amount of wealth that is out there and how it is distributed to your quality of life. Yeah. So in societies where, um, where within the society there's more equality, you live longer. You trust, your, you trust the people around you. You're bound to have um, less, by, by like 30% less um, mental illnesses. It's out of this world. Mm -hmm. And the people who studied this studied this in, in, in like in also relating to rating in OECD and in how much the country would make as opposed to the individual and the relationship to the richest and the poorest. And this is the main, this is the main thing. So when right. you live in a society where you can't trust the person next to you, you're unhappy and that affects, and that affects your biology. It's unbelievable or very much believable. Right. Uh, Martin, I think there was um, a misunderstanding of uh, some of the claims that you made regarding the relationship between intelligence and the high probability of divorce. Can you explain this correlation of, of, once of more? Divorce. And the high probability of divorce. Is it more intelligent people tend to get more divorced? Depends or is it vice versa? Married, I'm sorry? Well, it depends on who you've married to. <laughs> <laughs> So well, correlation. More intelligent people just don't get married. <laughs> oh, don't get <laughs> so uh, correlation is a <laughs> tricky concept, right? Because you can have so many hidden background variables. Uh, generally speaking, people with a higher EQ tend to not get divorced as often. But you have can you you can have several. Uh, this must not be a direct consequences because people with high IQ also, for example, uh, tend to marry later in life. And we know generally, if you marry later, your probabilities of not getting divorced uh, are higher. 
than if you marry, say, with 17 or, or whatever. Um, so this doesn't mean that this is independent of one another, but it can be very indirect over other things. Also, your, your salary is uh, generally, your income is a higher one if your IQ is higher. So this could also affect the divorce rate, etc. cetera. Um, so um, there is this correlation. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are causally linked. Um, it does also not mean that, but th this doesn't exclude the, that, wow, Jesus, that they could be <laughs> indirectly causally linked, nevertheless. It's a complicated concept, actually, this correlation stuff. Fine. <laughs> Marriage is complicated. I, I hope I satisfied everyone now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you did. Um, all right. Um, I, I, I'm not sure how to progress. Like pretty much all of the questions that we have are related to genetics in one form uh, or another. Uh, but I'm, I'm certainly interested in... Um, there is an interesting question here related to architecture again. So what is the... How, how does different types of architecture affect our way of thinking? Meaning that if you're speaking about changing human behaviors and human beings, can we do that through architecture? Yes. We've How? been trying to, right. but the thing is, I mean, architects always joke about how wonderful it is to be a doctor because you get to bury your, you know, failures, and mm -hmm. with architects, it's just, it's still out there. Jesus. <laughs> 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 I didn't expect that you will, <laughs> you will be the darkest one here. <laughs> no, th this is common knowledge. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, oh, where, where to begin? There have been so many, so many interesting examples in trying to, to cater to different either um, philosophical approaches in society and build for that. Or, um, for example, like a, a, a feministic take in architecture that was done um, early 20th century, actually proposed a housing block that didn't have any kitchens per, um, per apartment to encourage women to go to work. It had one communal kitchen in the ground floor. Everybody took turns. It's a bit like a kibbutz, if you know the, um, the type of uh, communal settlement that is found in Israel. Everybody takes turn in working the kitchen. There's a small <coughs> elevator going from that kitchen to each apartment. And then you have it. Like you don't have to cook anymore. You're you're freed from that obligation. You can go and. Didn't the communists try that in the 50s and it worked out horribly? There were several attempts in in forming so many built environments. I would say it have to. It has to do with like going one step back. So there's so much correlation between your natural habitat and the kind of culture you form. Um, desert society is different than a tropical society. You have different stay, uh, um, traits, you have different cultures, you have different stories that you tell, different mythologies. And architecture was always deemed as a kind of, um, how can I say this, like a medium between humans and their surroundings. Right. Mediating, protecting, but also alleviating and helping to dream. Um, uh, I, there, I need you to guide uh, me a little bit because there's so much about it. Um, like right. Uh, there, were, there were studies uh, you know, made and, and now we have you know, actually th this practically being applied in some countries in which you know, the claim is blue light reduces crime, for example. So, so in order to be more specific, like for instance, if we have more windows, in our houses, you know, and, and everything is more transparent, let's say. We see our neighbors, you know, it sounds horrifying, but still. You know, does, <laughs> how, uh, do we know about, like, maybe social psychological studies that have been made in this regard? Yes. Something uh, more specific? Just the, the, the answer for that. So, um, what I was re relating to earlier, the, the, the mistakes we don't get to bury, in the past, <laughs> We used, to we used to speculate about it. And whoever was a smarter or more in-tune architect got closer to the, the right result, which would mean the best fits the solution for a scenario, hopefully. Nowadays, we have sensors. We have simulations. We can actually test the building before it's being built. So we have this predisposition, right? We, we love a natural light. It makes us happier. Of course. And there's a phototaxis. We can justify it in so many ways. Um, but now we can actually 
look into it. When you're designing an office space, and this is, this is an example of a, a research I took part in, uh, in the previous office I worked for, we were trying to optimize a floor plan for an office space and taking into, uh, taking into account different parameters that had to do with visibility, one thing, natural light, another thing, um, a comfort that has to do with acoustics, um, also um, thermic conditions around you. But then we wanted to challenge the floor plan a bit further and to cater specifically to workplace that has to do with innovation, like within a business. So what we thought about is that if we promote random encounters between people who work in different departments within the giant building that is the workplace, that would push forward innovation. This was based on a study that was done in the 1970s in MIT. Um, if you know the Ellen Curve, it has to do with that, sure. promoting communication. And how would you design a space around that? So we started simulating and providing different illumination and um, different sections, like how wide or narrow uh, um, a space is, for example, and also uh, relating to body-related parameters. Like, I can recognize your face from this distance, which would increase the opportunity of you and I starting a conversation. Had you been 50 meters away, that would never happen. Right. So how would you design a space around those parameters to promote those random encounters <coughs> to maybe give way to people collaborating in a non-formal way? Um, now, did I answer your question? Yes, yes, Good. thank you very much. So, so um, I'm sure it's a very interesting field and, and we will learn more and more. Like same same as uh, as genetics, you guys. Uh, you're speculating quite a lot at this point. All right. Um, in order to wrap this up, uh, final question for each one of you, and let's do this like a blitz. A blitz. Uh, I was about to say creek, but that's <coughs> not the direction that I want to go. <laughs> uh, so a bl <laughs> blitz question and answer. Uh, what would be the formula of better life? Of a better life. I mean, what? Just each one of you. Give a give us give us an advice. I think, the, the, for me, far less equality. A, a country that's genuinely run for the people rather than being run for the few people at the top. Yeah. Sorry, because you said far less equality. Oh, the sorry, far, far more, more sorry, equality. More, far <laughs> more, yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> far, no, no, I want to be at the top. Um, yeah, far more equality. Right. Uh, it's not clear to me that states are being run. There's, an, there's this impression that states are run for the benefits for the citizens. I don't think they are. Right. I think they're run for the top. Gilly? And I'll add to your point, because I fully agree with it. Um, governments should be regarded as housekeeping organizations. I'm done with ideologies. They should do the best for everyone always. It's housekeeping. All right. That's all that is. I mean, as a resident volcano space fart expert, I'm not sure how much I can weigh in on this. But I would say, if you ever have a chance just to go see a volcano erupt, it will make you feel small, but not insignificant. It will just kind of make you feel like Earth is amazing and you really, really, really are lucky to be here, so don't fuck up your life. <laughs> That's the essential I get. But yeah. Oh, and uh, yeah, like I said, if you fart weird, you see a doctor. <laughs> Volcanoes, but one exception. I have to echo the world is still a wonderful place. Like, I, I, I can get lost in. <laughs> <laughs> I can get lost for minutes just watching a cat sleep or watching a caterpillar crawl up a... I mean, there are things that are endlessly fascinating even though we've killed so much off. It's, it's, it's beautiful, it's fun, it's good to be alive. Um, so I'm just reinforcing that. Uh -huh. That's not my answer. My answer is get rid of, parabolic, or get rid of hyperbolic discounting. <laughs> I, think, I think if you get rid of hyperbolic discounting in, in the human cognitive function, uh, if, if, if we stop hyperbolic discounting, I think everything else follows. I think we become able to internalize long-term consequences as much as we can internalize short-term benefits. And I think that might provoke a change in, in, in attitude that could only be an improvement. And I think everything else would follow. Right. But, but still, stuff is, there's a lot of really cool stuff out there. I, I do just love being alive. and I'm a biologist. I can't walk down the street without seeing something that fascinates me. Right. Pigeons so are especially. Pigeons are great. So, so, <laughs> so happy that you decided to not kill all humans, because <laughs> I would probably be among the first who, have, who get picked. Um, but but uh, I think when it comes to a better life, maybe on an individual level, it turns out our brains are wired in a way, not as we suppose that we get happy when we achieve an aim, 
as much as we get happy, uh, happy when we set an aim and see ourselves moving towards that. Um, so I think when, when it comes to quality of life on an individual um, level, then it's mostly about you know, setting aims and finding meaning. Um, and that is something very different than what we usually think about when it comes to happiness, because maybe happiness is not the right term here. Yeah, I don't know. Find something meaningful. I'll, I'll say two things. One is, um, I, I guess, a, 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 a utopia is uh, an equilibrium or um, a space where freedom does not hinder equality and equality doesn't hinder freedom. But that's an aspirational thought. I also think that um, we've come a long way in dismantling all sorts of discrimination within human society. Um, there's going to be a time, hopefully, in, I don't know, 30, 50, 100 years from now, where we're going to look at this period of time and say, we discriminate against people because of where they were born. And that's ludicrous, the fact that a person was born in this geographical location and not that geographical location somehow hindered him in life. And that hopefully will um, go the way of other discriminations that we used to, used to have and now don't. All right. Okay, so thank you very much for your, for your participation. I'm going to ask you to you. have a seat at the audience. Thank you.